to the Change the Game podcast, where we are changing the game by doing business differently and highlighting stories of capitalism at its best. I'm Steve Baker, and with me always is Rich Armstrong, president of The Great Game of Business and co-author of our new book, Get in the Game, How to Create Rapid Financial Results and Lasting Cultural Change. Hello, Rich. Hi, Steve. How are you? Well, I am exceptional today. If I was any better, I'd be twins because, man, I'm telling you, we have a real legend with us today. We're excited to to welcome our special guest, Greg Crabtree. Now, Greg is a speaker, author, entrepreneur, a financial expert. He uh, has used his entrepreneurial skills to to develop Crabtree, Rowe & Berger, PC, a CPA firm, that uh, focus solely on the needs of entrepreneurs, helping them build the economic engine of their businesses. And then in 2020, Greg merged with a top 20 U.S. accounting firm, Carr, Riggs, and Ingram, uh, working with entrepreneurs all over the country in a broad range of industries. Uh, Greg simplified financial reporting and empowered all entrepreneurs to take ownership of their finances. And he has pioneered a revolutionary metric for driving business profitability measuring labor efficiency and developing uh, simple benchmarks for uh, the company team and individual performance levels. And then in uh, 2011, also uh, uh, he published his first book, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. Sounds pretty good to me, um, especially the simple part in which he uh, shares his core principles of how to turn your business into a wealth building engine. And then his second book uh, was just recently published, Simple Numbers 2.0, Rules for Smart Scaling, uh, and he did that late last year. Greg Crabtree, welcome to our podcast. Yeah, well, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Great Game of Business, and uh, we refer to that quite often uh, in, in our consulting with clients, and, and you know, so just uh, really, really honored that uh, you guys would have me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Greg, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to start out with a question because it's probably more my interest than the audience's interest, just because I'm an avid golfer myself. Is that <laughs> I read that you're an avid golfer and you enjoy you know, playing historical golf courses all, whenever possible. I'm curious about what's the most unusual golf course you've ever played on. Uh, the most unusual? Uh, that, that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I would say the most unusual is a, a course that's, that's actually close to where I live uh, that's gotten a lot of popularity. It's a little course called Sweeten's Cove. So it's a nine-hole golf course just south of, of Chattanooga. So it's about an hour from where I live. And uh, I would say it, it, it's quite an interesting little golf course in that the way that they've developed it, that, you know, a nine-hole track that most people will play 18, they'll play it twice, but... Uh, it, it's garnered a lot of a uh, lot of interest. I, I'm a huge fan of the the no laying up guys um, that are you know kind of golf enthusiasts that uh, you know guys that probably came from business and, you know but, uh, but they're they're really you know good golf amateurs and they actually shot some some video of some of their events there. Uh, but it's it, it's really kind of a kind of a cool place. But uh, I will say that it really, when it really comes to golf, I've uh, you know, COVID, it, it kind of messed up my, my rhythm of, uh, I've generally gone to either Scotland or Ireland once every summer. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, this past year I didn't get to go, but my, I'm actually planning to go this year, uh, and, and get to Ireland, uh, for, uh, try to get to the Southwestern part, but I, that's where, I mean, I, you, you can't beat golf in the kingdom, uh, yes. you know, when it comes to that. So, yeah, that's one of my dreams for sure. Well, we'll have to get you down to the Ozark soon, Greg, and play some golf here with uh, Johnny Morris of Bass Pro. Just, you know, built uh, three or four new golf courses right here. I, I, have, I have had my eye on that place. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, come down and visit us sometime. We'll go out together. Yeah. I'd love to That'd do be, that. That sounds great. That's awesome. Well, let's get into an area that uh, that I can understand. And that <laughs> <laughs> Greg, how did you... Uh, how did you first begin your kind of journey in helping entrepreneurs? Well, you know, like, like all crazy people, I had a really good paying job as a controller for a bank and VP of operations. And I got this wild hair to, to go into business for myself. And it was really well planned. Uh, I, you know, my, my wife was expecting her third child. I had a house that we just bought and, um, you know, I had no money saved and no clients. So it was a perfect time to quit and start my own business. You're and, motivated. <laughs> yeah, I was really motivated. And, um, you know, but I, you know, uh, 
apologies to any accountant who might be listening to this, but uh, the everyday practice of accounting sometimes can, can drive you nuts. And uh, especially when it's around, you're dealing with taxes and those things. And, and I always found that the random projects that I could work on to really work with a client to fix something and make a business better uh, I mean, really, I, I kind of feel bad that I had that I charged them to do it because I was really at the time learning more from them than, than probably I was helping them. Um, and then just happened by chance to, to hook up with an organization called the Entrepreneurs Organization uh, in 2001 and, and really more so to just be peers with other entrepreneurs. And, you know, much like Great Game of Business community, you know, when you have a community of businesses that are privately held, they can get together, share data, share data in a common language. You know, we found that that was just a, a real simple uh, boost of everybody's capability. The problem is, is us accountants kind of get in the way of that. Um, we don't all speak the same language. As much as there's general accepted accounting principle standards, I would probably, don't, don't tell the accountants I said this, <laughs> general accepted accounting principles generally do more to hide truth than to illuminate it. And, and so, the reality is, if you really look at true business, you, you know, an entrepreneur has an intuitive way. The really good entrepreneurs are, in, are really good at understanding finance in that, that practical way. And I, I had, I, I've been forever changed by, um, I, I went through in 1998, many, many years ago, I went to the two day, you know, plant tour at uh, Springfield Remanufacturing and, I was just flabbergasted by the fact that you had machine operators that could explain balance sheets, P&Ls, and cash flow statements better than any accountant I'd ever met. And, and I knew that we had to do something different, you know, in that mm -hmm. process. And so between the interaction of organizations like Great Game of Business, um, organizations like EO, you know, and getting input from other entrepreneurs, I really kind of be began this journey to say, you know, we, I, I need to do something different. And what we found was, is we turned the business model on its head and said, instead of being an accountant who, who snuck in some consulting when they weren't doing taxes and financial statements, I said, you know, what we first need to lead off with is how to help people run a better business. And, and I'm not worried about the rules of accounting. I'm not trying to help them understand functional finance uh, in, in that way. And as we just tested some things and looked at, at different aspects of things, you know, the material started to come together. I started to do some speaking on it. And next thing you know, you take your speaking notes and turn them into the first book. And first book turns into a consulting practice. And then that turns into a second book. And, and, and so, um, you know, and, and like I said, real, even though we merged a year ago, I'm mean, still running the same practice, you know, that, that we were running before we merged. I just have access Interestingly enough for me, we could grow the consulting practice with no problem, um, and, and, and it was more so the traditional accounting stuff that we need. We would sometimes have surge demand that we couldn't always hire to, and so being part of a larger firm like Car Riggs has been wonderful, you know, from that aspect of there's a ton of things I can do that I don't have to do or we don't have to do in our office, and so we can really focus on Hey, how do you run a better business? How do, how do you do those? And, you know, we run multiple mastermind groups, some with industries, some are blends of businesses. Those are fun, you know, when you get people together and you can share data and mm -hmm. get everybody talking the same language, but they can see the movement of the data and you let the data tell the story. Mm -hmm. And if you can get your data to the point to where it can tell the story, you're, you, you're so far ahead of the game amongst everybody else that you can then start acting on that data. It's awesome. Yeah, Jack Stack always says uh, numbers are just stories about people. They are. Yeah, absolutely. And, and oh, by the way, the last time I checked, there's nothing that happens in business without human effort. <laughs> so uh, I think humans are still here to stay for a while. <laughs> well, running into you over the, over the years, uh, Greg, in different uh, conferences and different business events and things. It's always been interesting. I've, I've really loved your approach to that. And it's, it's really powerful for our audience to, I'd really encourage you to read Greg's book because it is, is built, his concepts are really built about really understanding the numbers from what you can do to actually influence those numbers, not just understanding what happened, but how you can use them to really guide you to what to do next and what, what you should do to improve your business. I would, I'm curious when you when you talk about that, Greg, and I know you've had a lot of opportunities of sharing this with a lot of entrepreneurs. 
What's been the biggest roadblock for small business owners when you know, when they're faced with understanding the numbers or understanding money? Well, it still comes back to the, in the first book. I mean, the first thing I start off with is is distortions. You know, we we do things to our data that hides the truth. And, you know, the number one distortion for a business under five million dollars in revenue is owner compensation. Mm. And so if you get them to put the correct owner compensation, whether you take it out or not, I, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll fight that argument later. But I need to see true profitability of what the job that you do in the business. So as we say, you get paid a salary for what you do, you get a return on what you own. Don't confuse the two. So I am, I am adamantly opposed to this concept that is rampant in the, in the franchise industry, of uh, what they call it ODP, owner's discretionary profit. So where they take profit plus owner compensation and say, oh, that's, that's what you make out of business. No, it isn't. No, no. I mean, you know, the piece for the salary piece that you should be making out of the business, I got news for you, over the arc of the life of the business. There's sometimes you're worth that money and sometimes you're not. There's sometimes you'd be better off paying it to somebody else who's actually better at it than you and you just be an owner and an investor. And that really kind of led to the overarching theme of the second book is really how to run your business as an investment and really appreciate the, the enormous wealth building capacity that a privately held business does for you. There is nothing in the marketplace that can yield the return that a probably held business can in the U.S. market and in most markets around the world. You know, so if you we've got clients in U.S., Canada, Australia, um, you know, Europe, eh, eh, you know, not quite as good uh, in, in some cases, um, certainly Latin America, you know, depending on what country you're in, uh, Asia, you know, kind of depends on where in Asia you're at. Third world countries, I've done, I've, I've been fortunate enough to present my material, you know, in 15 countries around the world. And I've often said that the only difference between a third world economy and a first world economy is the speed in which cash moves through the system and, and really not so much cash, but margin. And, and when I've done presentations in Africa, you know, it's like people keep trying to think to be an entrepreneur, you go grow your business by getting a piece of business from the government or a big multinational company. And I go, no, no, that, that's, that's not, you know, go do what the market needs. I said, there's a ton of people out there that are going crazy doing stuff. And that tells me that there's need of the market that you're not even thinking about and go solve that need and run a business that, that uh, that's needed by the market. And really the last year has, <laughs> has proven that philosophy that we have uh, because we literally had, we only had one client go out of business and they were in, you know, kind of a touristy business in San Francisco. And, and so and that can go back into business any moment, you know, if they, if they're, if the tourists ever come back, you know, but, but out of the other 300 businesses that we manage out of our office here, literally nobody went out of business. And matter of fact, shh, don't tell anybody, uh, many of them had the best year ever and shh, don't tell anybody, but they got a lot of cash and, and, you know, doing the necessaries is a wonderful thing. In business. It may not be the sexiest thing. It's not Google. It's not Apple. It's not Facebook or, or WhatsApp or, or whatever, but you know, it's the stuff that, that, you know, people build great wealth employ a lot of people, do meaningful things that serve their, their communities and their families. And, and I, I, just, I just think we need to learn to love the necessaries and, and build great businesses out of that. Great message. Yeah, no kidding. I, I also like the fact that this must be a tremendous podcast because about half the content so far has been followed with shh or proceeded with <laughs> don't tell anybody, yeah, don't tell anybody. Yeah, that's right keep those secrets coming greg keep, keep um, those secrets that's right <laughs> in your first book um you you talk about the uh, uh an organization's key financial indicators uh and making smart decisions using those right. um you say the number one key performance indicator is the amount of tax you pay i think this is really going to be very interesting to <laughs> our listeners so can you talk about that a little bit I just had a discussion with a client this morning that uh, you know just just paid out 1.6 million dollars in, in in cash for last year's taxes, and and they were okay with it because they they buy into the idea. And I said, you know, you take that number times about three, uh, and I can tell you how much the how much where the other cash is, you know, that you got to keep because you paid those taxes. Mm -hmm. it, 
it it really grew out of this frustration of watching people make good profit and then throw it all away in the last two weeks of the year. And it's like, why are you doing this? I mean, to spend a dollar to save 40 cents in tax, if you're not in New York or California, to spend a dollar to save 50 cents in tax, if you're in those states, I, wh why? I mean, that, that economics doesn't work. And I, it's really kind of one of the things that my favorite field of study that I'm, I would consider myself a, uh, an, an amateur, but I'm gaining experience every day is the field of behavioral economics. Humans do not logically make the right decisions when it comes to finance. It is not a natural behavior. It is a learned behavior. And the more that you can then learn those proper responses, there's a great behavioral economic study based on cab drivers in New York City. And a cab driver will rent a cab for 12 hour shifts. And on a slow fare day, they'll sit in the cab for the full day. On a good fare day, they quit at two o'clock. Why would you do that? <laughs> This is just not, this does not make sense. But we do, we see this play out in human behavior. And so in knowing these things, I said, okay, what can I do? What is the information that I can do to change people's responses to that information? Well, it starts with better data. If you actually, if you, next time you sit in a cat or sit in a car, an Uber uh, driver or Lyft driver, start talking to them. I, these are always fascinating people to talk to to just see how they got there. But Uber and Lyft have figured they know about that study and they prompt the drivers to drive when the fares are plentiful and keep driving while the fares are plentiful because that's when Uber and Lyft make money too. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're motivated to connect to that. But people left to self-manage will not achieve the highest output potential and the highest best result. And like I, I said, you know, early on the, you know, we, we are in an economy that still requires labor to be productive. And, and to me, that's my biggest worry. We are out of really good quality labor in this country. We saw this right before the COVID uh, uh, impact you know, started. And we had seen a slowing of the economy from our data set going into that. And then now in the last two months, we've seen this surge of demand and now it's just a free-for-all of fighting for the existing labor and, and people stealing from each other and offering stupid amounts of money and getting people to move and it, it's it's a real problem and we're we're going to keep fighting ourselves and keep pushing inflation i mean they're not even close to calculating the real inflation number that actually exists right now you know it's interesting you mentioned greg this you know, challenge we're in, in terms of war for talent, you know, I mean, just here at SRC, we have a hundred job postings open right yep. now. Exactly. It's not, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And you talk a lot about managing productivity of labor. It's like a, a key metric mm -hmm. you talk a lot about and you use right. an analogy around salary cap. Is there anything in that, those lessons that would maybe help people manage through that? Yeah, the thing I was really proud about is in the new book, I've got a full chapter dedicated to LER, labor efficiency ratio. So if you ever heard, if you ever hear anybody say LER, you'll know that they're a simple numbers fan because that, you know, that's <laughs> our term. It, it, it's unique to us. And essentially, the way we look at it is saying it's not about labor as a percentage of something. It is about taking a dollar of labor and what is its output? Because what, what can it produce? What is the leverage that I get from the deployment of a good dollar of labor? And it just turns the map, you know, the other way. And it's every, think about this. Every dollar of labor in an organization has a numerator that's held responsible for. And, it's, and that numerator is never sales. That numerator is either gross margin or what we call contribution margin, which is gross margin minus direct labor. So those are the two primary numerators that we look for. And, and so what you're looking for is this way of saying, how quickly can I deploy a dollar of labor and ramp it up to its optimal productivity? And oh, by the way, because labor is the only cost that comes to work every day with an attitude, it's not a con constant output. It, it, it has good days and it has bad days and I got to keep it at this, this run rate you know, throughout time. And, and so labor efficiency ratio and is, is a number that tells a story as you see it plotted across time. And, it, and certainly rolling 12 is the truest number, rolling three is, is the next truest number and so forth. And, and so 
if you're a business that has seasonality, rolling 12 is the number you got to focus on. If your business is pretty consistent 12 months out of the year, I can get you to focus on rolling three and say, this is really the predictor of where we're, we're currently at. And is my gross margin to direct labor dollars going up or going down? Because notice what we focus on is not a, a economic number per body. I, it, it just drives me nuts when somebody says revenue per person, profit per person. I, I got news for you. That, that is dehumanizing. I mean, just stop it. I mean, there, I, last, I don't know about you guys, but I've never seen two people that, that are equal. I mean, everybody's got different skill sets. Everybody's got different capabilities. And it's not about that. But the one thing that is equal is a dollar. And so for a dollar of labor input, what is the output that we get? Now, then I can start to narrow it down by person. In my industry, I can measure literally the bill dollars by every person who works for our firm to their salary. So I've got a labor efficiency ratio by person. And when I stack rank those across the grid, you, you learn pretty quickly who's producing and who's not. And, and it's, and I, I'll tell you a little secret, you know, if not the highest paid people are the best producers. <laughs> so <laughs> got news for you. And, and what we've been seeing lately in this world of labor is this idea of much faster arcs. So think of an arc as in terms of the career lifetime that somebody's going to be with you as a business. And what the winners that we see right now in business are the people who can take someone fairly early, maybe they're just below the, the immediate needed skill set that you have, but you can take their raw skill sets, infuse them with some very quick onboarding and focus training to get them quickly productive and then continue to grow them to even greater productivity. Now, the key is how long is that arc going to be? How, how long will we keep them? And, you know, that's a challenge you know, in, in the moment, but, but I think the, the businesses that are good at, at training and onboarding and, and just lather, rinse, repeat, they're going to be the winners, you know, in, in the long term. No, good point. Well said. Well said. Um, we, uh, so I'm thinking about your second book. Uh, you brought it out. You published it in uh, late uh, 2020. Uh, was that intentional, um, you know, around the <laughs> pandemic or was it just happenstance? No, it's called when you finally get around to getting it done. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, I've probably been fiddling with that book for about four years, uh, but it was kind of, you know, good that it came out. And, um, you know, and, and so, you know, I was getting close to finishing it pre-merger and then, you know, it was supposed to come out fairly close after that, but between the merger and the pandemic, you know, it, it just kept dragging on and, and you know, and they're self-published. So, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's up to me to, to, to get it done. Um, now, the good news is, is I actually have just finished uh, going to the studio and, and, and doing the audio version of both books. So that the audible version will be coming out here, hopefully within the next couple of months. Uh, and what was funny was, you know, I, I had not read the first book for 10 years. You know, I mean, I, I, you might look at some piece of it and somebody refers to it, but I hadn't read it word for word for 10 years and which I had to, to read it because I, I really couldn't let somebody else read it. I mean, it has to be my voice. And, and so I go through a day and a half to read it. You know, I get done with it and I go, you know, that was a pretty good book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I was, I was, yeah, I I was kind of scared. I was kind of scared, you know, it. to read every word, you know, how much of it, you know, but there was only one thing that I didn't leave in it. And it was this tax comment that I made that the rules are different now than it was when I said it. And so I, I left that. But other than that, I mean, I, I really felt good about everything I said the first time. And then the reading the new book was a little bit easier because literally every word in that book I wrote, the first book I had to get a writer because I, I really wasn't very practiced at doing this. And I've had to write a ton since then. So uh, you, you kind of get a rhythm and, and get to where you can do right. it. Kind of find you, your hire, hire, you hire people to correct your subject verb disagreements. <laughs> so. so just to follow up on that, um, could you, uh, for our listeners, could you kind of compare or contrast the two books? Yeah. So the first book is clearly, it was, it was developed for early stage entrepreneurs. And so generally I would say 5 million and under. Now, I have found people much larger than $5 million businesses that have found it very useful. I mean, so, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's got some very strong principled ideas 
Because really, if you think about it, a $30 million business is probably a collection of $5 million businesses. And, and so to a certain degree, that's why those are the business owners that still find that first book quite, quite usable, because if you're, you use it for division management or segment management in those principles, because it, it, it still is true. The new book is really does not know a beginning or end. And so I would say for it, it's really overarching that, um, I mean, literally, we've had, we've talked to $2 billion size businesses about the concepts that, that they wanted to use in it. Um, and in a, in a startup, it matters just the same. Because really, the idea is, I'm trying to get your head wrapped around this idea of business as an investment first, and then understand you know, so I would say, whereas the first book, you know, I did make that statement about how big of a, a, a check you write to the IRS is the key performance indicator. Really, I would tell you that the way that truly manifests in true KPIs is return on invested capital. And so in the second book, I, I try to bring this measurement that, to be quite honest, I, I had, had not done since college. And then I was at a, uh, I, get to, I get to chair an executive ed program at Horton Business School with like legitimate professors and, and they let me share a little bit of my stuff too. And, and so, uh, you know, but David Wessels, I have to give him a lot of credit. He's the one that kind of turned me on to this uh, ROIC calculation because it's really a, it, it, it was the number I was looking for to win an argument. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the value of your business as an investment. And that pre-tax profit number is no different than the yield on a CD. At the end of the day, how much money did I have to put in to get this much money out after I've been paid a market based wage? And so I'm not distorting those financials. And when you start to look at that number, the number was astonishing, whereas the public market probably runs somewhere in the 20 to 25 percent range or less. I mean, we were seeing numbers. I mean, literally, our belief is no business in that's probably held in a in a developed first world economy should be less than a fifty percent return. Wow! I mean, just think about that. I mean, what? Why would you? I mean, why would you ever think about messing up a business, an investment that gives you a fifty percent year after year after year after year return? Would you? Wouldn't you want to reinvest in that as much as it would take reinvestment? Yeah. Now, and now a lot of times the business marketplace itself is closed to reinvestment. There is no more market share to be gained without a, a, something dramatically different, a new plant, a new geography, you know, a new li- a significant new line of business. But until you've run the course of market penetration and something is, and, and, and we say 50 is the minimum, I would say the average of our clients are about 75 to 100 percent return. We've got one industry that we deal with, uh, quite a few clients in the managed, IT managed service business. Their their average return on investment is two hundred percent per year. Wow! So so it gets down to this thing of understanding your only your challenge is not cash. Your challenge is execution. Mm. Cash is is eminently available if you figure out how to execute. I, I, there, there's not a single business I'm having trouble getting funded if I can get them to execute. That's great. That's great. And once you, once you understand it now, part of that return on invested capital is this, we've, we created kind of a simplistic view of the building blocks, kind of the DNA of capital in that there's three things that, that work on your balance sheet and one that hides in your P and L. And, and that, that one's, that one freaks out all the accountants because they don't think of capital being on your P and L. But guess what? In the real world, it is. And, and so the three things that, that are on your balance sheet as capital is my, what we call trade capital. So working capital that is the classic measure of current assets minus current liabilities. I, I hate, I hate to, to make the bankers and the accounts feel bad, but that's a stupid measure. <laughs> and, and, and here's why it's stupid. Because it contains two numbers that should never, ever have been in there that are choices, cash and debt. Cash is a choice. Debt is a choice. The others are market forces. There's a market forces AR on you, inventory, work in progress, market forces of AP, accrued expenses that normally turn over, and deferred revenue when, when potential. And so it's the idea of, it's the net of those things that turn over is that key number. Now, 
my good friend Alan Miltz that he and I do a lot of presentations together, cash flow story. Alan's got a lot of great material. He and I really, really sync up well together. You know, Alan has a lot of good material on how you look at each of those components. But as you know, and, and some of this, I was sitting in a presentation he was doing, we were doing a joint presentation together and I'm sitting there kind of thinking on this and I'm going, well, really, if you kind of take the two, all of them together and say, but that's really, at the end of the day, I can mush on these things from a lot of different ways, but it's the total number that matters. And we look at trade capital relative to trailing 12 revenues, and that's a key building block of your capital structure of the business. And, and the reason why you say, well, why, why do I need to know that? Well, if, you're, if your trade capital averages 25% of trailing 12 revenue, guess what? If you grow by a million dollars, you got to invest two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that revenue just to turn it over before you get the first dollar back out. So it's an incredibly important number to tell you about simplistic cash flow forecasting in that process. Now, the way do I mitigate that is how big is my profit percentage? So what we've really there's a term that we put in the new book called CPR, cash power ratio. What is my trade capital percentage compared to my profit percentage? So when I can get trade capital percentage below my profit percentage, I'm a cash flow free growth business. Cash is no longer a problem. Just go grow, just go do it. And if I have trade capital above my profit percentage, we say, okay, what can we attack? How can we get profit up? How can we get capital utilization down? It's amazing to me how many people just don't ask, Mm -hmm. you know, just ask your customers, can you pay me faster? Can you pay me some in advance? Can I get a vendor, you know, to, to give me better terms? We, we had this one Amazon reseller that he went to his, his suppliers and he said, hey, you know, I know you've given me 30-day terms, but, you know, I, I got this crazy idea, but I think it'll work. How about if you give me 75-day terms, I think I can sell 10 times as much. <laughs> and they go, okay, that's, a, that's an interesting trade-off. And then he proved that he could do it, actually. Wow. Because he had more free flow. He was able to always have product, kept pushing it through the system. And because Amazon actually was a pretty good payer and and timely payer, but giving 75-day terms because he could turn things so quickly, he was able to cover not only his inventory demands, but also cover part of what Amazon was still waiting to pay him, even as fast as they were paying. And he basically had zero cash in everything that was turning over. Wow. And, and when you are in that position, that's an enormously powerful position to be in. Mm-hmm. So true. So true. But we've had, we've had industries where, so we do a lot of clients in the staffing industry. Staffing industry is notorious for one of the worst trade capital percentages of, of any business out there. They generally carry about 25% uh, of, of revenue in and receivables that they they're having to pay they get no trade support there's nothing there's no liability side to to do that until i ended up with a staffing client in australia and i'm looking at his balance sheet and we're going through the numbers and i'm going this is weird uh you have negative trade capital which means your customers pay you in advance and i go uh i don't i've not seen that for any of my clients how did you do that it's just well we ask really (laughs) you just ask and, and, and if you think about it, and this really kind of created a, 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 a really interesting line of thinking, because if you think about it, why does somebody not pay you timely? Well, there's only three reasons. Number one is they ain't got the money. Uh, well, that means I don't want them as a customer. So let's, let's get rid of them. Okay. Wh- why else? Um, they don't trust you. Okay. Well, you know, what are the ways that we can build trust? I'm going to deliver the service. I'm going to deliver the product. Okay, let, let's work on winning trust. And then the third reason is they just want to be an economic bully. Well, you know, there were classic examples. You know, Dell was known for this, you know, years ago. They've gotten a lot better from what I hear, you know, but, but essentially, you know, companies that used to, you know, the CFOs that used to pat themselves on the back and break their arm doing it, trying to think about how much they held your cash, all they're doing is harming the system. And, and I will tell you from looking at finance globally that, As I said earlier, the faster that you can move margin through the system from start of the transaction to the completion of the transaction, everybody wins. It is a win-win scenario. We get the cheapest price, everybody plays fairly, and we can get back there and do it again and again. 
And what you're seeing right now in the marketplace is this great dysfunction of things aren't moving fast through the system. And what happens? Prices go up, yep. costs go up, terms change. And, and it, it's, it's like, we, we got to get back to this free, quickly flow. And, and that's the, the nature that you got to get to. And that's when, every, and literally, like I said, it, it's where it levels the playing field and where we enjoy in the U.S. literally little to no barriers of entry for any entrepreneurial adventure versus you better have a, a big bucket of cash if you're doing it internationally. That's some great lessons. That's, that's very, very valuable, Greg. And mm -hmm. I love how you're bringing it back to the current economy that we're dealing with because we're, we're you know, we at SRC specifically, you know, with supply yeah. chain issues and people issues is that we're making a lot of financial decisions in trying to manage that. And if they understood the concepts you're talking about, I think they may be making, they may maybe be making different decisions, right? So right. I think that's exactly. Well, I think also when it comes to people, you're finding that people are getting a little creative too and finding if I don't need physical presence of the person, where do where are some pockets of people um, you know that can be accessed, you know, that that really can do it. And I I, I won't share where <laughs> give away <laughs> secrets. But you know, one of my clients ha has an incredible source of technical you know, labor uh, in, in supporting a, 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 an IT product. And it's just in this little remote town with a little college. And, you know, the, 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 the workers love it because they love living in that area, but they don't have to be anywhere in that process. And it, it's, it's a good classic example of the win-win, but those are hard to find. But, but, you know, but I think to a certain degree, I, I think what, what you've got to do in the current labor market, and this isn't going to get better anytime soon, so you better just start it now, is go, go identify every piece of labor that doesn't have to physically reside where you're at and go find that labor and those sources in, in the places where they do exist. And then of the people where you have physical labor, you're just going to have to pay whatever the freight is to, to, to keep that labor. Mm -hmm. and learn how to how to continuously develop it because we have much shorter arcs of beginning and end of employment. Driving the productivity. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned earlier, and you talked a little bit about this, Greg, is is uh, your introduction to open book management, Jack mm -hmm. Stack, and a great human yep. business. How has that concept of transparency and education of the, of the financials all through the entire company, how has that influenced your passion in working with entrepreneurs that understand the numbers? Well, I, I mean, we find that there's, you know, it, once you create a structure of people understanding the data, there's much less fear of sharing it. And then as people get into performance management, well, you, you got to share, you know, some of that data. I will say that my practical experience has kind of settled into, I, I believe 100% of the companies can share what we call contribution margin, revenue minus cost of goods sold is gross margin, gross margin minus direct labor is contribution margin. I, we don't see any, I've not seen anybody with a credible argument, whether they did or didn't, but nobody has a credible ar argument to not share that, that data. And what we find is, and the reason why that structure, so we believe contribution margin represents the most important number in the P&L. It's not net income. It's actually contribution margin. Contribution margin is the pure output of the business engine. And so, and realistically, when you get into business sales and acquisitions, most transactions are, whether people realize it or not, is based on contribution margin, not net income. They, they'll, they'll talk about numbers about net income, but I guarantee you somebody in the back, whether they've realized it or not, have worked back into how can we take that margin and bolt it on to our unabsorbed operational costs that we can be more efficient with and do more with it. And mm -hmm. it, so it's a concept we refer to as a strip sale. So most purchases are not purchases of complete businesses. You're purchasing that economic engine of the business and bolting it onto your existing operation. And mm -hmm. it's the reason why you'll see some stupid numbers of multipliers. For, when you see a stupid multiplier number, there's a different reason why they bought it you know, in, <laughs> in that regard. But by showing them that number, we think it's a safe number. And so like when we run you know, a, a, a similar version of the great game of business bonus program, you know, that, that you guys are known for uh, uh, in, in deference to Jack and, and the critical number, 
we believe there's one critical number. It's called contribution margin. <laughs> so we, we base all of our minimum target stretch goals off of contribution margin. Got it. Planning, you know, in that process. And, it, and it's, it's worked beautifully. Um, and, and, and really, you know, conceptually, you know, works really strongly. The, the interesting thing about operating expenses is, um, you know, the average person really does not have a lot of impact on those. And, you know, I, you know, if, if, if you, if you really have the culture like you guys have, which is really hard for the average company to, to pull off, you know, we, we find that, you know, if, if you don't really have the commitment that, that, you know, great game of business followers have to really put that culture in place to really look at every line item in the P and L. Okay. Well, let's, let's do the next best thing. It says, let's just look at those as a total and say, and let's just agree, you guys don't really have any choices in this and we'll, we'll be responsible for that. And, and like I said, then I can just really get them to focus on the output number. Mm-hmm. And, and we've had really good success, you know, with that of, of getting people to, to understand it and, and respond to it. Um, and, and really it, it creates a simplified language. It, it's almost funny, the less financially educated you are, the better you are at understanding it. And the more financially educated you are, the harder is, well, what about this? And we got to allocate this cost. And it's just, it's just stop it. You know, don't. It, it, simple numbers. It's simple numbers, man. You know, <laughs> make it, don't make it harder than what it really is. <laughs> no, I think you're, I think, uh, I, you know, I totally, totally understand where you're coming from on that. And, and, you know, the history of you, where this, a lot of this came from with SRC, a lot of that was tied in that contribution, right? Getting our frontline employees in yeah. the decisions that they were making every day can influence that margin. But I, I will tell you the number one thing that I say every day that I'm on a call with a client, this great game of business inspired is the constant reforecast. Yeah. I will tell you that the number one thing that changes the direction of a business is the commitment to forget about the annual plan. It's called reforecast, 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 and get, and, as, and, and I see people get tired of me quoting Jack. He says, listen, I don't need you to be an optimist. I don't need you to be a pessimist. I need you to be a realist. <laughs> and and, and let, let's develop that, that, that forecasting muscle. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you constantly do it, you get better at it. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, it's, it, it, and in the end, it's the, it's the quickest way to really understand the numbers that drive it, right? So, But see, the problem is, is... Yeah, I mean, this is where, like the clients we work with, we have, a, we've created our custom simple numbers, you know, forecast model. And so we're, you know, our, our service that we do that we're known for is we take our clients data out of their antiquated accounting systems, no matter how advanced that they may be, and say, no, let, let me help you actually see this in a real way. And, and we've got it down to a really easy, very low labor, you know, concept, but it's get it into a format that we can work with it. And literally, you know, every call that, you know, we're, we're on, we're taking, here's your data that has happened. Now, what's about to happen? I mean, every call we're going, okay, what's happening? You know, what's hard forecasted over the next two to three months or a year, you know, it depends on what kind of insights you have. And then we flip over to the balance sheet and say, well, what does that do to cash? And, you know, and, and what does that do to tax money that needs to be set aside? And what does that do to, money that okay you got this much excess cash what are you going to do with it can you is there something we can reinvest back in the business so by the way we reinvest it back in the business and it works we're going to get 100 percent return on that mm-hmm. let, 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 we want to look look there first but there is a point that no 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 ideas and i there, there's nothing <laughs> I, I can't throw any more dollars at it to make it go faster i just got to get better at it Awesome. Well, this is this has been great, Greg. I really appreciate all the uh, all you know all the insights, and I think it's going to just be absolutely uh, valuable for the audience that we uh, we have here with this podcast. We do in the we in the podcast with a, a a question often is just trying to get back to um, the idea of you know what is a what is a question we should be asking you right now? What is something we've missed in our discussion here that we need to be sharing to this audience? Um, I mean, I, I, I think the, and I, I've said it, but I want to, I want to re, uh, re-emphasize it. Yeah. 
your number one challenge to grow is not cash, it's execution. And, and it's, it's understanding this idea of what are the things that I need to do and do better to grow my business. Because if I get the right capital uh, aspects of trade capital right, um, you know, what little money, uh, the, the one number I didn't talk about is this idea of launch capital. So launch capital is that capital component that hides in your PL. So think about it like every business, every person listening to this podcast that runs a business, I want them to think about what did you spend money on in the last 12 months that nobody made you spend that you spent to grow the business and it hasn't shown up yet in the revenue. So you're, it's a prospective spend. That really shouldn't, if you were doing an adjusted EBITDA calculation to try to sell the business, you would take that out. And so I really try to get people to do that on an ongoing basis. So I want them to understand here is the discretionary expenses that I'm spending in my business that I'm not executing on correctly to grow the business. Mm -hmm. And I want to hold that accountable. And there's a whole chapter in the 2.0 book on launch capital concepts with a couple of successful businesses that we navigated through this, this idea to us to essentially assign what is that targeted improvement in profit, not revenue, but profit, because I've spent this catalytic spend of either marketing, labor, tech dev, whatever those catalytic spends are. But these are expenses in the PL. But it's teaching people to be better at execution, I think, is the greatest barrier, even in a tough labor market. If you're better at executing, the, the finding and the development and the onboarding of labor, you will beat everybody else by a long shot. Well, that's really good advice when you have a limited labor pool. Yep. <laughs> and, and, that, and it's going to stay there. Yeah, so just accept it. Just embrace it. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Greg, this has been so fun. Now, I, I will uh, always try to give my takeaways, and I bet I got it wrong, but I have about three pages of notes here. So. <laughs> I'm gonna just, if I get any of it wrong, please correct me. Um, I love this one. Run your business like an investment and no business in the United States should yield less than a 50% return. That That's is correct. powerful stuff. You talked about behavioral economics and the choices we make versus market forces. Be honest with yourself. Look at those things. Um, here's one that is really big for our audience. There's one critical number and it's not net income. It's contribution margin which is margin minus direct labor. It's the purest output of your, of your business engine. Did I get that right? Yep. That, by the way, I was an art major. So yeah. good for you, Greg, teaching me stuff. I love this one. This is so speaks to me. The less you're trained in the numbers, the easier it is to get it. Yep. <laughs> what a gift. What a gift. It is. It is. It and is. Uh, you had a couple of number ones that I want to share again with folks. The number one, uh, thing that you ought to be thinking about is, is a commitment to reforecasting all the time. Don't be an optimist, right. pessimist, be a realist. And the number one greatest barrier to growth or challenge to growth is not cash. It is execution. Right. Absolutely. You got so, it. Great recap. Well, couldn't, I couldn't say it better. All the great stuff. You, so your books are Simple Numbers and Simple Numbers 2.0, and they're available just about everywhere. Where would folks go to get a copy? Uh, I mean, they're available on Amazon. You can also go to simplenumbers.me is the book website. There, there's actually some downloadable spreadsheets from the first book that are on that website, you know, that, that are free, you know, tools to just knock stuff out if you like playing the spreadsheets. Um, you know, but, uh, and then, you know, there's, there's tons of presentations I've done that people, I, I'm, I usually freely let people record them. So if you just uh, go to YouTube and search on Greg Crabtree or Simple Numbers, there's, <laughs> there's quite a few of my, my, talks out there as well if you really want to geek out so. all right well we're going to geek out on greg Tra crabtree thank you so much greg sure appreciate it um let's keep the conversation going everybody let's uh, make sure that we get your questions your stories your best practices ideas your challenges and your victories that is capitalism at its best thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time <laughs>